from the Z Podcast. I'm joined here today, as always, by Lexi, Danny, and Rachel. How are you ladies doing today? Hi. Doing good. Hey, How are you? Good. Now, I know me and Lexi are down here in Tampa preparing for the Hurricane Ian. How's everyone else doing, though? Good? <laughs> We're fine. I'm in Texas. It's yeah. nice and beautiful, <laughs> clear skies out here. Yeah, it's like it's 63 and sunny right now. I mean... Well, I'm being tough and staying because I don't let out, outside influences impact me, but Lexi apparently is caving <laughs> and apparently going to I'm her weak. parents' house. I well, get a text from Lexi like late at night yesterday. Well, late at night for me, a grandma. It was like at 8 p.m. Um, <laughs> it's like, so I wasn't freaking out before, but then my parents got to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, and it, also I watched too much of the news, and, you know, they're making it like rightfully so I know they have to make sure everybody's safe but I just I was getting in my head last night but I'm here so that is good and I will be here were you worried about recording this morning is that what it was well no I wasn't necessarily worried about this morning I was just worried about getting over to my mom and stepdad's in time like before traffic and before the bridge closes which I don't think that'll be till tonight so that's why I was like because like as of right now I'm looking out the window and it's it's nice. I mean, it's not raining. It's it's gloomy, but I mean, it's Don't they call end up going to your parents' house or are you at home? I'm still at home. So I oh, had a okay. couple, yeah, I ended up moving around a few calls and posing sessions to early this morning. So I'm still at home and then I'm going to plan on walking to the gym after this and then going over there. So priorities. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, we appreciate that you are risking your safety, you and Evan, for well, this podcast. You. Evan Lex is risking her life. I'm not. I'm completely fine. But Evan, she's is, her life. Evan is so calm about this. He's the like at the type of people like Evan like are the people I need to be around because I don't do well when I'm around <laughs> people that are like freaking out. I'm like because I feed off of that. I do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think it's. I was telling Lex before. Like my job before I was a full time coach was I worked for uh, large rental companies in the pump and power division. So. Um, we dealt with a lot of generators, so every major hurricane for the last four years, I've been like on the ground in the middle of, um, and every single time it has been overblown, every single time. Yeah. Um, I guess the worst one was last year. There was the one in New Orleans, but that was really just power outages, and they were back. They were supposed to be gone down for like two months. They were down for like four days and back on, and everything was fine. So, yeah, these things really don't worry me as much anymore. But um, I can understand why they do. So, yeah, different strokes of different folks. So. Anyways, on to actually important things and subjects, like <laughs> when should you compete and when do you know if you're ready to compete? Yes. I think that's a question that we've all had. Um, it's a question that I had when I first got started. So I guess we can kind of go around here and first of all, get you guys kind of general overlook on this question and um, then we can go from there with it. So Lexi, what do you think? So how to know when you're ready to prep? So I guess my condensed answer actually ironically I just had this conversation in a phone call before this but you know there's a couple things that it comes down to so in a nutshell I always like to I really preach that you should be living this lifestyle before ever considering prepping like I don't believe that it should be a matter of um you know like oh I've been you know I'm, I'm interested in competing I've been training for a year and I haven't been tracking my food but I want to compete all of a sudden I feel like you need to have those basic fundamentals down and in place so tracking your macros have a solid routine with the gym with training have a solid routine with just staying on a plan so to say I think that's a big one for me and then of course you have the other things with regards to do you have enough muscle for the division you want to go into? Um, you know, do is your calorie maintenance in a good spot? Is your cardio maintenance in a good spot? Um, you know, there's a lot to weigh out, but I guess that's my kind of condensed answer, so to say. I probably have a little bit different outlook than everyone else on here, but I kind of want to hear what everyone else's general wow. outlook is first. I'm excited yeah. for your answer. Yeah, yeah that'll be too. interesting. Danny, you should go next. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, honestly, I have a whole list of things that I would love for us to touch on. I'll basically just fill in the gaps on anything that you guys don't touch on because this is something I'm super passionate about. Um, but I really, I have actually a, a little unique perspective I wanted to share prior we get into the details. So we're going to sit here. I imagine all of us are going to go through, you need to do this. You need to be at this roughly this many calories. You need to be eating this many calories for this long. You need to be financially ready. You know, all these details we're going to get into. 
Um, but I do want to say, you know, the whole reason when I got into competing, I didn't have all my shit together on that, on all these things that we need to have. And I just went for it because I wanted to get into it. And when you, you like everybody starts somewhere. And so I feel like, you know, it is our job as a coach to educate our athletes on all of these things, on what you need to have prepared to go into a prep. But we also need to remember and understand like what we were like when we were at that stage when we were first trying to get into the sport. And for me, like my calories were not ready. I had been training for like maybe six months. I had no muscle. I I did all the wrong things, but like here I am 10 years later and it's because I decided to dive into it, you know? Yeah. So I that's, that's kind a really of a, good point. a, a unique that's a perspective. Great point. I think definitely consider. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. But um, <laughs> my, I think, I because I did the same thing, right? Like I, when I first decided to prep for my, for the first time. It was because I had just learned about bodybuilding like that prior year. It was in 2015 at the it was in October and um I had decided to compete like earlier that year sometime in like January or February. I like told my boyfriend at the time who was a coach, quote unquote, um not really um, I told him like, I'm interested in competing and he was like, okay, cool. Let's, uh, I think we first did like a fat loss phase sometime in January. And then, you know, saw, I saw abs for the first time, right. It was my first time actually dieting. And then we went back into more of a, a building phase, right. And, um, tried to build a little bit more muscle. If I built anything in that time, I don't know. Um, and we, and then we did a 12 week prep and it was, um, probably, it was definitely the worst prep I could have possibly had. But um, I learned a lot in it. And so I, I guess I was a little bit more prepared than you were probably, Danny. But I also, like, I hadn't done any research on coaches. I just figured, oh, I'll just do it with this person who wants to prep me, this, my boyfriend. And then just, like, went for it. And I had so many negative experiences throughout the prep that by the end of it, I was, like, dying for something else. And that's then when I found Paul. Um, after that prep was over because like the show itself was really, really fun. And I was like, Oh yeah, I love this. I want to do this again, but I want to do it right. And I think that kind of brings me to my point where I like had the butt at, after your thing is of just like, yeah, just get into it. Just go for it. Is like I, as a coach, and I think all of us as coaches, we want to, it's similar to like how parents think about raising their kids. Right. Um, like we want better for our clients. And we want better for the people that we're leading or inspiring or motivating or whatever, whether it's our followers on Instagram or our actual clients um, or just friends who get into competing. I want, I don't ever want someone to have the experience I had with my first coach. And so that's a big part of why I do, am very passionate about this subject of like, don't compete until you're ready. Um, because there's a lot of things that people don't think about before they compete, like mental health, um, like physical health, things like that, that like they don't get better with a prep. And I think those are things that are really often overlooked. And, you know, luckily for all of us sitting here, if we did ever go into a prep without thinking about that stuff, we're all still alive. We're all still kicking and loving competing and loving right. coaching. But it is something that, that you should think about is your mental and physical health. Um, right. Those need to be really good before you enter a prep. And I, I think like checking things like checking blood work, uh, making sure that you don't have a super crazy or toxic relationship with food or your body or anything like that. Like those are really important factors to not overlook before actually starting a prep. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree with like a few things you said that really stood out to me there is, I, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like a lot of people, um, not not a lot, but some people, they turn to prep as kind of a way to fix other issues that they may already have. They think that, oh, okay, well, I'm going to start prep because I'm really struggling to stay on a plan or I'm really struggling with binging, so I'm going to start a prep because it's going to solve everything, right? <laughs> no, and it's not. No, and so... Exactly. Spoiler alert. It is not going to solve any issue that you already have at hand, whether that be an issue with your relationship with food, digestion issues, um, you know, your body image, you know, if you struggle with body image, prep is not going to make that better. If anything, 
it's going to amplify everything that is already at play there, right? So I think that's why, like, as a coach, I know that if I have a client that's expressing to me that they're, you know, they're struggling with binging or maybe they're just, their relationship with food is not in a great spot or they're really struggling with their body image, you know, I always say we're not in a spot where we should be starting prep. I mean, yeah, we could start prep, but prep is going to be a band-aid for those issues and chances are it's only going to make those things worse and worse as the prep prolongs. All right, Evan. Evan, Evan give us your uh, controversial opinion. Yeah, I, I'm going to pretty much, um, I understand what every one of you guys said, and I agree with every single bit of it. Um, but. I think but. one thing that's very important is to understand that no two people are built the same. Um, I jumped into this sport for the exact opposite reason that every one of y'all did. I jumped into it because I couldn't stick to a diet, and I wanted something to force me to stick to a diet. Um, but my personality, the way it is, is that if I told everybody, I knew I was doing a show, every single person, and I was either going to be one of two things. I was either going to be a quitter or I was going to stick to it. And for me, that's what I needed to actually stick to something. Um, now with that being said with that, that's my personality type. So I do think it's very important for a coach to be upfront with their client and the client to be very upfront with the coach. My goal wasn't to go in there and turn pro or to be a world beater. My, my goal was to actually look decent and not get last place. That was my goal with that and to be able to stick to something. Now, kind of what you're talking about, like a point in your life and trying to, um, it's not going to fix anything. Um, for me, it really gave me something to focus on because I had a girlfriend at the time, this was years ago, and um, we had just broken up, but I was already committed to this show. And in the past, I just would have gone out, got hammered, hit on girls, made a ton of bad decisions, but I didn't do that because I was in prep. It gave me something else to focus on. It gave me something that, you know, tangible to reach for. And it honestly, I can't, my life could have been completely different if I didn't just commit to that show. And the reason I committed to that show was I met a guy at the gym and he was in shape and I'd seen him before and he wasn't in shape the last time I saw him. And he told me he was doing a show and I knew nothing about it. Um, he put me in touch with his coach. I talked to his coach. I said, do you think we have enough time? He said, I think we do. And uh, I jumped into it. Um, it wasn't a great experience. It wasn't a great experience. Uh, the show was not great. It was uh, one of those NSL shows, if anybody remembers that. Because I didn't even know what NPC was back then. I knew nothing about any of this. I just wanted a reason I had to stick to a diet. That was it. Um, but then I ended up meeting a guy there who ended up being my coach for, uh, for quite a while after that, um, who saw some potential in me and taught me into doing another show. And a couple weeks later, um, I got smoked, but it motivated me to get better with it. And then my goal slowly changed from just not getting last to why am I not getting first to winning an overall to going to a national show to turning pro. And it just cascaded mm -hmm. upon that. So, I think it's very important to, um, I, I think bodybuilding is great. I think every single person can benefit from a prep if they're in a good place mentally, but it also determines on, on, on the individual person. Like if somebody would have looked at my situation, they would have said, no, this is not a good time to start getting into bodybuilding, mm -hmm. the, the situation I was in. But it completely changed the entire trajectory of, of my life. I mean, it really honestly did. Yeah. Um, and then most recently, there. you know, I... You know, I had a, a breakup that I went through, a breakup of an engagement, and I was, you know, 12 days after my pro debut. And that's honestly what kept me sane during that, having that thing to focus on, having that tangible goal. Um, so, again, I completely agree with everything that you guys said with all this stuff. I really honestly do. Um, but sometimes but you just got to do it. Sometimes you just got to do it, you know. Yeah. Like, there's never, and here's the thing I also want people to understand is there's, no perfect time to prep. Um, I say this about my old coach. Um, his name is Lloyd Hertford, very good guy. He won his class at Nationals in open bodybuilding or, or whatever class it was in bodybuilding um, like five years ago. Stupid good physique. I'm talking like just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. But that man has never done a pro show and he's come up with every excuse in the world why he's not going to do a pro show. So there is no perfect time in this world to start. But make sure you do have certain things in line. And I think mental strength is one of the very, very important ones. And being honest with yourself. If you haven't done it, if you haven't tracked macros, if you haven't done anything like that, and you aren't in the best shape, 
Don't tell everybody or don't think you're going to walk out there and win the overall. Don't hashtag yeah, road to pro. Don't do any of that stuff. Yeah. yeah set realistic yeah. expectations. Yeah. Know where so. you're at. Know that like your first show or even like your second or third show, like as an amateur, you're not going to look like pros. Like, no. yeah, definitely follow some pros, get inspired, get motivated, watch their posing routines. Like that's a great way for amateurs to, to look at posing. But don't expect yourself to look like a pro. I had a girl who was doing her first wellness show this year, and she was really, like, nervous and just kind of freaking out a few weeks out. Like, I, I just really don't look ready. I'm like, look, you are looking at people like Yurishna or, like, Dr. Sunny Andrews, and, like, you're expecting yourself to look like that. You have amazing shape, but, like, you're not going to look like that yet, and that's okay. So I think that's something to think about, it too, is just, like, not letting yourself have too much of like these wild expectations just go into your first show if you're a beginner or if you're you know still new as an amateur and you're doing your second or third show or something like that go into it as like a you versus you thing like yes you can go into it wanting to win and like prepping with the hope to win and hope to do really well like definitely be competitive but you don't know if you're going to win or if you're even close to winning unless you're on stage and you see the people next to you. Like it's all about who's there that day. It's not about how you look on Instagram. It's not about who hypes you up on Instagram. It's not about what your coach necessarily says in hyping you up. I feel like a lot of coaches hype their clients up too much. And that is like to the detriment of those clients. I see it a lot where someone thinks that they're going to go pro because their coach told them they would. Um, a lot of coaches honestly promise that to people before they sign up in hopes that they will sign up because like, oh, well, this coach told me that I'll probably have to wait a few years before turning pro, but this coach told me I'll turn pro this year. So I'm going to go with this coach, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can't go in with super high expectations and you can't, like, if your coach is going in with those promises or high expectations, then just tread lightly because they might just be blowing smoke up your ass. Yeah. And, and, and one more thing, and then and then I'll let get back to everyone else. I, I just don't want to forget this point. When I started this too, um, I think a lot of us don't realize bodybuilding is far more mainstream, especially competing now, than it was five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. Five, six years ago, I, I didn't know anything. I didn't know there was a men's physique division. I, didn't, I couldn't tell you anything that, that was out there. Now, my trajectory, I'm sure, would have been much different because there's so much more information out there. Mm -hmm. Then, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about anything with it. So um, now I think everything would be a little bit different. Like if I had to go do it again, especially because I'm kind of like a planner type. But, um, you know, it's uh, I think that that's really, really good. Good advice. Rachel. I, I hear that from people all the time. And I also hear the opposite um, where people talk themselves out of ever starting a prep mm, because they yeah. feel like they don't have enough muscle or they like unless I am going to be good enough to to win and go step on a pro stage right away, then I don't want to compete. I'm like, you, first of all, you don't even know what you look like shredded. Mm -hmm. right. Second of all, you don't even know if you like the dieting down process. You don't even yeah. know if you like anything about this. Or show yeah. day. Some people do the, like the process, but they absolutely <gasps> hate show day. Yeah. Yes, I had that happen to a client who like, she literally canceled after her first show <laughs> with me because she was like, I realized I just hate bodybuilding. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> wow. okay. I mean, like she, just, she didn't like the trying. glam. She didn't like the tan. She didn't like how the how if you get if you're fifth out of five, you still get a trophy. She's like, I got last place. Like, but I'm like, yeah, but that's because you like they they're your top five of five. Like they're gonna give trophies. Right. You're like I just don't think they should do that. Really? I respect that. Yeah, I do too. It was, <laughs> it was definitely respectable. She was very logical about it, um, and I, I respect her decision. Out there for her. There's definitely yeah. a sport out there for her. I don't know totally. what it is. Totally. She but. wanted to try it. She was gung-ho. She put everything she could into it. Um, you know, there was... I definitely think that, you know, for people who it's their first show, you got to go into it knowing that, like, you might not like that. You might not like it as much as you think you will. And I try to tell people who are new competitors that, not to try to bring them down, but I try to tell them, like, it's okay if you don't like it. Like, let's start with this first goal and not make, not nail yourself or mar marry yourself to a bunch of other goals past this. Like, cause you know, some of us will get client consults who are saying like, you know, they've never competed before and they want to go pro. 
I'm like, well, you might not even like competing first. You might not like what it does to you. It, you might not like being shredded or like having that amount of muscle on you. Um, especially when people want to, like when women want to go pro in a more muscular division and they don't know quite what that means. Um, so it's, it's super important to just like get a feel for it. Like, understand what it feels like to have that amount of muscle, what it feels like to be shredded, what it feels like to be six weeks out, um, because you might not like it. And that's okay. Not, it's not for everybody. I think you a never, lot of people think because I lift and love lifting, I, sh- I have to be a bodybuilder and I have to compete, and that's not true. Yeah. So for absolutely. bikini girls, um, a lot of them don't realize until they do it how tiny you get as a bikini uh, yeah even like you do require a lot of muscle but like when you don't have a pump like you it, you look emaciated yeah and sure. so usually when my competitors start telling on. me like i feel really tiny i'm like good we're almost there <laughs> yeah so, I know. my family's uh, telling me to eat something good yes you're almost okay there. good we're almost especially there. earlier on in your competitive career yeah when you don't have that is, muscles Yes, because I can tell you this is the first year that when I died it down, I did not feel small. And it's been six years. It took me mm-hmm. to get to that point. And I've lived in my yeah. entire life. Yeah. When I, I when I died down, I do not like how I look at the end. Same. Like, it's Same. all for that one day. I, I prefer myself at least five to six pounds above my stage weight, at least. Yeah. Same. I remember wearing – I actually started going to a different gym uh, towards the end of my prep because I just didn't want – people that had seen me for so long to see me so like small and start making comments because I just didn't want that to get to my head um but yeah I'm like you Danny I don't really like the way I look when I am stage lean but it's so funny because I always joke that it's like the stage lights and the stage it almost adds weight to you because you know you yeah you would see my stage shots and think oh okay she looks like somewhat healthy and I think that's why it's Plus so deceiving too. exactly exactly right but when you see me off stage like that same day I looked so tiny so I think that's why a lot of times people don't realize how extreme the sport can be and how lean you have to get because they see stage pictures and, and you know most of the time stage pictures make us look really full and, and somewhat healthier whereas off stage <laughs> when we're at our most depleted um you know it's it's depleted, not no makeup it, uh, like, yeah diet face oh god oh yeah it's that just not terrible. a great look it's just not a great look um but you know going back to what everything you guys were saying like sometimes you just you just have to try it out you know to know if you're gonna like it to know you know, what it's going to be like. I think back to the first time I prepped and, you know, if I had somebody that came to me in those same circumstances now, I would most likely, you know, try to talk them out of prepping at that stage in their life. But at the end of the day, I mean, was it a perfect prep? No, but I learned a lot. And, you know, you don't know what you don't know at the time. So I was kind of just forced into it or not forced into it, but I kind of forced myself into it. And, um, you know, it could have been worse, but I've continued to learn season after season after that. Yeah. And that's the key in all of this is like, even if you go into a prep starting for the wrong reasons or at the wrong time, quote unquote, then um, you're still going to learn from it. And as long as that learning process doesn't like, you know, really fuck with your health or something, then like, it's probably a good, it's probably a good thing. Even though, even if you reach like rock bottom with something, what some part of your life or something goes wrong or something like that, like you're still going to learn. And that learning process is a part of life. And it just means that, you know, yeah, not everyone has to learn that hard way. Some people prepare themselves and protect themselves a lot more. Um, You know, people that listen to this episode might protect themselves in the future from uh, starting prep at the non-optimal time. But if you don't do that, then you're still going to learn and that's going to make you better for next time. And it might help you, you know, help other people. I have a lot of, um, I had a competitor of mine who's in an off season right now, talk to me about one of her, she goes to a gym where there's a local team, local coach there that is very present at that gym and just telling me all these terrible things about this coach. He's like, um, he just treats his athletes really poorly, unfortunately. Um, and just really with a lot of disrespect. And she was telling me this about how she was talking to some of his athletes that were like asking her for advice and they were all newer and they were thinking that that's just how it is. Like their coach being like that is just how all coaches are. And she then like kind of paid it forward because she has a coach from our team, she has me, 
um, we're all much more respectful of our clients and we you know, care about our clients. We put people first. That's a big value of pro physique. And she helped t let someone else know that. And that just has a ripple effect, hopefully. You know, hopefully those clients will then, you know, speak up for themselves with that coach, or maybe they'll change coaches, or maybe they'll, you know, get out of competing for a little bit and think about what they really want to do. Um, it's really important to be reflective of like, am I okay with this? Whether it's treatment by a coach or whether it's a protocol or whether it's like a, a timeline that may be being forced upon you or pressured, you're pressured into, um, it's important to speak up for yourself. And to, to piggyback kind of what Lexi said too before, I have two quick things and I want to ask you guys a couple of questions. Um, Lexi, when you're talking about how like the stage adds weight to you, I can remember specifically last year because I rarely actually sit and watch any any shows that I'm competing in. <clears throat> but I know I'll go to a lot of shows and I look at the stage and like, man, especially like the men's physique class because like, man, these guys are so good. Like they're huge. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting at Nationals last year watching like class A, B, and C, and D, which are the shorter guys, you know, maybe up to like 5'8". And... Um, not saying if I'm age short, but you know, shorter than me, I'm, I'm like almost six three. So I see these guys on stage, and I'm like, these guys are insane looking, just insane. And then I go backstage, and I am literally probably fifty five pounds heavier than those guys are, like not an exaggeration. Yeah. And just, but when I was in the audience looking up at that, it was a completely different thing than reality was. And one more thing that you were talking about about. And unfortunately now, because you have so many people out there, and there are, they do give away a ton of pro cards. Everyone thinks it's easy to turn pro. It is not easy to turn pro. Ooh, they give out a lot of pro cards. Oh, it's all over online. I oh, it's easy to turn pro. I think people complain about the fact that so many pro show or national shows <laughs> give away so many pro cards, like first and second place in but there's every so single many competitors. Class. There are. There's so many. And like, yeah, some clock, some shows, less people show up, and it mm -hmm. does seem like those people shouldn't have gone pro. They're not ready to be pro. Like, they're still going to give away the pro cards to one and two. They're not just going to say, oh, your class had less than this amount of people. We're not going to give you a pro yeah. card. Like, that wouldn't really be fair. Yeah. No, and I can tell you, too, do, do some people get pro cards that don't deserve it? Yes. But sure. those are the exceptions, not the rule for the Well, and they're going to see that when they go to a pro show. And right. so yeah, and they're going you know, like, to probably you quit after the first pro show anyways. Cream rises to the top. Yes, and there, there are other divisions as well, and I think this is important for me and client too. There are other divisions, you know, that are less competitive um, than than other divisions are. I mean, like women's bodybuilding and women's physique at There's national level shows, yeah. far less competitors. I mean, nationals last year, I think there was three or four competitors in in one of the classes for women's physique. And when it comes to fitness, too, that's another division that you know you may show up and win a pro card because there may only be two people yeah. in there. But something when you get into things like, like bikini and classic physique and men's physique, and you get into these other figure. Or, or these Don't other more popular figure, or fig, like figure yes, else. figure figure no figure is is <laughs> it the uh, now figures a really interesting when I was talking about this like the regional shows I don't see like a ton of really impressive people but you get to the national level shows and it is like where did these people come from yeah yeah like I have not seen anyone look like this at any of the shows I've ever been to yeah it is completely agree. night and day. How many girls at a national show are typically in a figure class? Um, usually, like, anywhere from 10 to 16. I feel like that's a pretty good number. In my class at nationals in 2017, there were 14 or 15 people. Um, so it was, like, two or three call-outs, I think. Usually that's about what it is. I think that's what it was this last year at NPC nationals as well, was, like, 16 or so people on average. Some of them are, are smaller, like, you know, the really, really tall class is usually a smaller class. Um, but, yeah. I think the, the last right national, the, I think sorry, the last national show that I did, there were 40 girls in my class. Yeah, that's bikini, there, you know. Like, yeah, there was so 32 in mine. I had a girl mine. at nationals last year, and she, there was, I think it was the biggest class at nationals. Um, I think there were 42 or something like that in her class. And she was kind of upset that she got, like, I think she got third call-outs or something like that. But I'm like, but look at how many call-outs there were. There were, like, yeah. six call-outs. Like, that's pretty good for your first national show. I mean, most of the time, yeah. like, the third, the first three call-outs a, in a bikini division <laughs> at nationals, they all look like they could be in first call-outs. Yeah. And, yeah. like, I know that I, we've seen this with, um, you know, I'll give Paul as an example, just because he has so many people go to nationals every year. Like, he had... 
I forget who it was, but there was a girl who got like second end of second or third call outs one national show and then like later on in the year she got her pro card like it wasn't yeah. even that much yeah time it, it was in between. she was like third cost and she won the overall yeah was that like, yeah kathy? north americans i think it yeah, was kathy, yeah, yeah probably yeah. shout out she to was kathy. like third cost and won the overall like oh, three yeah. weeks later yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and that that goes to show that like how competitive bikini is and how because it's literally splitting hairs it's like you it's everything matters so much everything matters with other divisions too but like you if you're off in any little way then you could be pushed to third call outs and you know then improve that one little thing a couple weeks later and win it all bikini is really interesting too because it's the one division that it's not just physique based Mm -hmm. like there's so many other factors that play into it that it's i I find it absolutely fascinating and over the past couple years in the situation i was in um fascinating and frustrating (laughs) yes i i really learned a lot about the division um Mm -hmm. with my history with aaron and stuff and i i could probably write a college thesis on it because i want to know everything there was to know about it and to me it's not really like a mystery like i can look up there and see exactly what the judges are looking at because i've studied it so much yeah but it is not something that's um easily to put into words on, on yeah. what it's really not i mean it's, yeah. it's no, it sounds like a cop out to say and that, so but. many people get so frustrated with the judging and they think there's something wrong with the judging because of how frustrating it is and how much it's splitting hairs and it's like if you really pay attention and if you talk to judges or get feedback or if you're a coach who gets feedback with clients like you know you understand mm-hmm. and yeah, most of the time absolutely yeah most of the time that's how it is yes there are some things like there's outlier cases but Generally, there's a really good reason, and if you have a good conversation with a judge, looking at you know who, why did this person win? Why did she get second or third? Then like they'll be able to tell you and give you a solid answer. Uh, yeah. But most people don't want to actually hear the solid answer. They just yeah, I absolutely them. agree. <laughs> I absolutely agree. I, and the, the thing with bikini too, it's regional shows. I do see some weird stuff go on sometimes, especially at smaller shows. I see some weird stuff happen. I'm like, eh, because bikini is so subjective. It really yeah. is. But I don't like really consider those. I'm thinking about like if Tyler's right, judging yeah. or if Sandy's judging <laughs> or national level shows, you know, where those people are going to be picking who turns pro. That's who I look at. And I- I'm sorry, but if you go to a national level show and you don't, you place where you're supposed to place. Yeah, I agree. Like and I if think- Sandy or, or Tyler judging, you place where you're supposed to place. There's no messing around going on there. Trust me. Yeah, like, agree. It is what it is. And I think a lot of times people, um, like more so with the smaller shows, right? It's the judges end up having to judge what shows up that day, right? So you're going to get some of these Mm -hmm. smaller, you know, shows, smaller local shows that, you know, maybe nobody really fits the criteria that well, but then the girl that wins the overall, you know, she was just the best that was there that day. And she may not fit the criteria perfectly, but you know, that's, that's something you have to consider as a competitor. You can't control who shows up, you know, and the judges are going to have to no. judge what fits the criteria the best at that show and at that given time. Yeah. I think yeah. we've kind of gotten off a little bit on a tangent about yeah. judging. So I want to, I want to transition by saying like, the I do everything podcast, you just you talked on. about it. I, yeah. I think we, we should have an episode about like judging, um, at a later date, but this subject this like how subjective the sport can be is really important for you to consider when you're getting into the sport and before you start a prep before you decide i'm gonna do a prep or before you go into your next prep if you're a a former if you're if you've already competed which is you have to have a thick skin you have to be objective about your body um and you have to be realistic about the fact especially if you're coming back from a season previously realistic about what you are actually looking like and have you made improvements from the past year because of everything we just talked about with judging it's really important that you do make solid improvements um, whatever was necessary for you to make from the last prep and if you haven't made those improvements if you've only been like out of prep a few months that's not enough time to make improvements for most people now if you don't have any improvements to make or if the only improvement was like a little bit extra delt or like better posing or something like that, then yeah, take less time off. But most people, especially in amateur leagues, or like if you just turned pro and you want to compete with pros, you need a lot more time to make the necessary improvements to be competitive. And so that needs to be something in the front of your mind when you decide, okay, am I ready to start prep? There should be buckets that you think about, especially if you want to be competitive. Here's a good question. I kind of want to ask each one of you this, this one right here. What are your top three 
suggestions to somebody. Say somebody comes to you on a call and it's like, hey, I'm thinking about competing or I want to compete. What would be the top three things that you would tell that potential client? Only like, what three. would you? Yeah, top three. your top three. Ooh, most important. Hang on, Danny, you go. Danny, you go. <laughs> no, I've got. Let I've me got pull up my list of ten. <laughs> I love that, Danny. I I totally would not expect anything less from Danny to have a list. So I love it. Well, I'm not gonna lie. I've made posts about this a lot, and so I pulled up one of my old posts, of, which is a very large. Got list. it. Got it. Well, let's hear your um, top three. Okay. Um, well, I think number one is you've been consuming a good amount of calories for a long period of time, aka it hasn't been a while since you've truly dieted. Dieted in a deficit, I think. Yeah, in a deficit. Clarify. So I think that one yeah. deserves in the, to be in the top three. Yeah. Um, hang on, I'm looking, trying to decide. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put this one in the top three, which is you have a good foundation of muscle. Because going back to my first point at the beginning, sometimes like. The way that you get into the sport is to just start. So I'm not going to put that in the top three. It's very important, and I will always recommend that to a client, that we need to build first before we do it. But anyways, he asked for top three. Um, Cardio, I think that you're maintaining weight doing minimal cardio. Not zero. I like to have some. Like maybe we're just going by 10,000 steps a day, but you don't need to be doing an hour of cardio and then start prep. So I think that one's in there. Um... I think the next one is probably going to be that you are, I'm trying to figure out how to word it. You're ready to make the sacrifices that it's going to require. I think that's really yeah. important. Yeah. That's a good one. And yeah. it's a good blanket goes. statement because there's lots of different types. Of we can go into sacrifices. a lot of detail on that, yeah. but I think that a lot yeah. of people don't realize the sacrifices that it's going to take. And I think that not only do you need to be ready mentally, but you need to be excited excited about it you need to be like antsy ready to diet so very good example prime example me right now I had a catch-up call with Paul last week we're talking about me eventually trying to prep I don't know when but I told him I'm like look I'm kind of thinking about it but I know my heart's not there yet so we're not going to diet right now we're going to just focus on building Mm -hmm. for a while longer so I know I'm not mentally in that at that point yet where I'm like super excited to diet the thought well when you guys were like on my ass about checking in with him in my head, I was thinking, like, I kind of want to lose, like, five pounds, tighten up a little bit. I got lots of, I'm going to, I got DJ's wedding that I'm a bridesmaid in, lots of stuff going on in October. And I'm like, oh, but if I check in, then I got to start dieting, and I don't want to diet. And then we caught up, had our call, and we decided by the end of it, we're not going to diet right now. And I'm like, oh, my God, I feel so much better. So that tells me that I am not in the place to be restricting right now. And That's I a really good that example. Absolutely. Incredibly important. I've been doing that a lot lately with people, either current clients or prospective clients, like talking about, well, okay, you kind of want to diet, but will you be able to commit to a deficit right now during when we're getting into the holidays? Because most people can't. (laughs) So just think about it. Why would you want to? If you want to, but you probably don't want to (laughs) if we're really being honest. I had a girl that was, we started a mini cut and like, Two weeks in, she was, like, really happy, really gung-ho. And then, like, week three or four, she was, like, she sent me an email middle of the week. She's, like, hey, so I realized I'm really not ready for this. I would rather be reversing and keep, and like, and keep going with building. So I'm, like, good for you for making that decision and not, like, crashing and burning with it instead. Mm -hmm. Or trying to keep going but then keep falling off and stuff like that. Like, I've had that happen with people and they just, like, they get so frustrated with themselves. And it's because they weren't in a mental place to diet. Yeah, you definitely have to be in the right mental space. And I think, um, you know, you have to ask yourself too, because prep can sound really cool, but it's like, you have to ask yourself, am I, am I interested or am I actually committed? You know, a lot of people are interested in the concept of prepping for a bodybuilding show and, you know, doing it because it looks really cool, but it goes back to, you really have to have that discipline and know what you're going to have to sacrifice because although some people have easier preps than others, for the most part, you know, prep is a grind. It's it's a lot of sacrifice. It's like pretty much like a part-time job. And if you're just interested in the thought of prep, chances are you're going to start and you're going to burn out real quickly and you're going to realize, oh, wow, this is, this is a lot harder than I um, anticipated. So I think differentiating between are you interested or are you interested but also committed you know, long term to make the sacrifices. Yep. Yeah. Very good. Who wants to go next? I guess I'll go. Because <laughs> um, I'm the next person. Um, 
So my top three would be internally and externally healthy. Um, that would be the biggest one for me. I've just seen too many people start a prep when they were already injured and then that injury got way worse. Um, like, you know, they had a bad low back injury or something like that and it just like wasn't getting better. And then you start prep, you get into a deficit and it might be okay at first, but then it just continues to come back. And when you're in a deficit, when you're dieting and you're doing lots of cardio, um, you, that's a stress on your body, right? Dieting itself is a stress on the body. Um, so is building to some extent, but at least when you're building and you have a calorie surplus, you have food to help you recover and you can take more rest days and there's no real pressure of, of time. Um, whereas you do have time pressure with the prep for the most part. So healthy externally, as far as like injuries, don't prep if you have like a lingering injury that you're not able to handle or that would, if it got worse, you wouldn't be able to train um, because that would be an issue. Now, if you're prepping and then an injury happens, I think that's where you kind of have to decide, okay, can I continue doing all of my things? Can I continue checking the boxes and not let this get any worse, but just kind of maintain it? Um, or will it get so worse that it gets so bad that like reach a, you reach a point of no return, right? So when you're in prep and you get an injury, I think that's a different story than if you were starting prep with an injury. Um, and then same thing for like internal health. Like if you have uh, an underlying gut issue or digestive, digestive issue, that's probably not gonna get a whole lot better when dieting if it's like a really serious one. Um, something like, I don't know, SIBO or leaky gut or PCOS um, as, as another, um, as another thing, if you don't, if you have something like PCOS or a, th a, a thyroid disorder, whatever, I'm just listing off a lot of different internal disorders, um, then, and you don't have a way that you manage it currently, there's obviously plenty of competitors that compete and do really well with any of these cases, but it's because most of the time they know how to manage it. Um, and they have like they're on medication or they have, you know, things that they do to help symptoms and they can keep doing, they can keep making progress with this condition that they have. So knowing what's going on internally and feeling good, not only just like feeling it, but also, you know, getting blood work done before starting a prep is a really good way to find out what's going on under the hood. It's not that everyone needs it, but if you're having symptoms that you're not really sure of why you're having them, then it might be a good idea to do that. So yeah, internal and external health is a big one for me. Um, two and three would be also metabolism, um, just making sure that your metabolism is in a good, healthy spot. And what I mean by that, it's, I think like Danny touched on this as well, like making sure your calories are high, but what does that mean for each person? It's gonna be different for everyone. So like some people, they might get their calories up to 2,200 calories. And to some people that might be a lot, especially to like smaller women. Um, but I know for me, that's not very high. Like I'm a I'm bigger, I have more muscle and I'm like putting more on. So if I start a prep at 2,200 calories, I'm gonna have to get really, really low and I might reach kind of a stopping point where I'm not able to lose any more body fat because I'm already at like the lowest I can possibly go and there's not a whole lot else I can do. Um, and so getting your calories to a high place, no, it doesn't guarantee that you won't have to dig with calories, that's not what I'm saying, but it does help. It helps because you give, you have more room to pull from and same thing with cardio. If you're starting your prep and you're already doing 45 minutes of cardio five times a week, where do you go from there? Like, are you gonna be at like 120 minutes a day at the end? Like, that's not really realistic. So- um, If you're there, at least you need to be responding from it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's another factor. Yeah. Right? So some people do have to push that hard, but at least I'm okay with pushing them that hard if we only have a little bit left to go, but they actually are responding. If they're not responding, eh, yeah, exactly. I had um, that with a with a client recently. We decided to post end prep and postpone it before competing because she just we were going we were digging as deep as we possibly could for like in a at least manageably healthy way, and it just nothing was happening anymore. And so she decided, yeah, I think I'm ready to just like take a break and, you know, think about early next year as a, as a time to prep. So yeah, internally and externally healthy is one, your metabolism being in a healthy spot, 
Um, and then the third one would be financially ready. I think that's a really big one that most, a lot of people kind of, they end up regretting a lot later on in life because they realize like after a whole prep is over, then they realize how much money they spent. And especially if you don't reach your goal, but even if you do reach your goal, like say you get your pro card, but if you're like $10,000 in debt because of how much you spent on going to national shows and doing the national circuit road to quote, hashtag road to pro, then like, what do you really have? You have a pro card that doesn't give you anything. Like <laughs> it allows you to be a pro and compete in pro shows and keep spending money. So um, knowing what you're in for financially is really important. Um, because Let's understand guys like that national shows cost about all in all, it's going to cost you about 1500 to grand to do a national yeah. show because of the travel. That's not including prep. That's just yeah. the show itself. Yeah. The travel, At the least. entry fees, the, um, the hotels, tanning mm-hmm. and makeup and stuff. Those are usually more expensive than local shows. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's super important. Do yeah. heels. That's like not including coaching, not including, no. not including it's a coaching, lot. food, anything. It's a lot. And like last yeah. thing I would want is for somebody to get halfway through a prep and then realize I can't compete because I can't afford this. Like mm-hmm. then what did you do? You basically just kind of, you know, kind of wasted the past couple months when you could have but been unfortunately, saving. I've had, I've had a couple clients where that happened. They didn't realize how expensive it was going to be, even though we talked about it at the beginning. Um, we get halfway through and they start realizing, you know, it's not just the coaching, the yeah. coaching that I'm paying for. There's a lot. Put more. yourself on a budget. You're an adult. You know yeah. how to, You should know how to do that. Yeah, finances. That's a big just, one. That's a big one. Just because their age says they're an adult doesn't mean they act like one. I know. <laughs> I'm a big, I say that a lot to like clients, like on Instagram. Like, be a fucking adult. Like, you have to think about stuff. You can't just like do things without thinking about them. Yeah. What about you, Lexi? So, okay, I oh, it's so hard to condense it down to three. I, I would say... No, I feel uh, like Rachel cheated. You're not going to lie. Well, Would she combine I'm, two of hers into one? Internally <laughs> and externally healthy? That's just no, health no. in general. The one after that. You metabolism? Combine, you said metabolism. So if you got to combine your cardio and macros and calories into one, then I should technically what? get one more. Metabolism is metabolism. I know, but I divided <laughs> mine out. That's on you, girl. I know. I thought I should get another one. But I was well, I, I definitely agree with Rachel for number one, like externally and internally healthy. I mean, especially internally, like I feel like that's what we more so see being it, or at least I more so see that being an issue rather than like external injuries, so to say. Um, but like internally, like blood work or just digestion, things like that. Um, I think that's a really, really good thing to consider before prepping because prepping is, you know, it's probably only going to make those things worse and it's going to make prep like really tough to be successful at. So I would agree with you, Rachel. I think that's my first and foremost um, biggest one. And then I think my second one is kind of going back to what I said at the beginning of this podcast. Um, I think that it's very important to have kind of lived this lifestyle prior to prepping. Now, I'm not saying you need to like be like, you, you, you know, I realize if it's your first prep, you haven't prepped before. But what I mean by living the lifestyle is, you know, being able to have stay on a plan like you should have and you know be able to track macros stay on your meal plan whatever it is you're on um you know be able to make it to the gym consistently like those things should not be things you're having to think about those should all be basic fundamentals that are just part of your life and just part of your routine um you know yeah have i seen it before where people just jump into a prep not having done that before yeah but usually it's a lot harder of a transition and um you know they struggle a lot more throughout prep whereas if you're already used to tracking macros going to the gym doing your cardio prep is really not that different of a transition the only difference is hey your food is getting lower and your cardio is getting higher so I think that is my um, my second piece of advice because I do get a lot of girls that will come to me with you know the intent of oh I want to start a prep but then they don't even know how to track macros so that's mm-hmm. what we always work on first. Kind of and, foundation. Yeah, I always say we need to really work on building the foundation first, get you comfortable with tracking macros, you know, get you into a good routine because that's just going to make prep like easier and more enjoyable, right? Because you're not having to change your like the your way of life that drastically. So I think that would be number two for me. And then, you know, number three, it's kind of a tie between 
I feel like metabolism, that's a big one, like in dieting history, you know, if somebody's been dieting in a deficit for, you know, on and off for the past, you know, years and years and years, that's a big thing to consider, um, you know, like where your metabolism is. But I'm also kind of going back and forth and, you know, I feel like muscle, I always, you know, I feel like I see a lot of girls, they get into this and they don't have enough muscle. And then what happens is they lean down and, you know, they're just, there's nothing to reveal muscle wise. And then they get on stage, you know, disappointed. Right. Um, so that it's kind of a tie between metabolism and having enough muscle. Those are kind of tied for number three, I think for me. I don't like only having three. I know. Okay, what is your what is your third one, Fanny? <laughs> well, there's at least two more we gotta cover. But I mean, okay. Evan still has to go. Also, um, well, hang up a bit. Well, Evan, how about you go first, and then if you don't say anything that I have, we'll go. Over. All right. Well, I think um, I, I know this is a really hard question to answer because this is like the very, very, very bodybuilding response to everything. But it depends. It depends. I mean, it depends. Is this their first show? Like, it's going to be way different if it's somebody's first show than if it's somebody's 15th show. Mm -hmm. I mean, your questions are going to earn your concerns and, and things that, the places that need, or things that need to be in place are completely different for those two. Um, and what is, what is the person's goal? Is that, is their goal just to step on stage as a bucket list item? Is their, is their goal to come in the best they can be? Um, you know, and that all depends on that. You know, um, if That's it's a bucket list important. item, you know. All right. Yeah. I mean, I'll help you if it's a bucket list item with it. Uh, it to, to me, it's, it's almost, I'm kind of a torn on that bucket list item thing because I want to help people achieve that. But in the same, I almost feel like bodybuilding is kind of a sacred thing and it should be done a certain way. Um, and I feel like if you can't bring your absolute best, then I don't think it's necessarily the best option. But that's a personal thing. And I would never put my personal beliefs on someone else, that, you know. I, I don't, bodybuilding changed my life and I would never allow it to not change somebody else's for the better either, I guess is a better way to put it. I um, know it's very fair. Yeah. Yes. We all probably feel that same way. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think uh, a big thing, never, uh, even if it's a first timer or if it's a uh, veteran with it, um, I honestly believe the biggest disconnect between people who perform well in shows and people who don't is their ability to train properly mm -hmm. and the ability to enjoy training. Um, I highly recommend that everyone before they consider competing is actually fall in love with training, not bodybuilding, not training. Instagram, not winning, but mm -hmm. fall in love with the training part of it first. Um, the, all the other stuff you can, you can learn. I mean, and you can, you can learn very, very quickly. You can learn to track macros quickly. It's not that difficult. You can learn to do it. Even if it's eating the same three foods for every single meal, you can do it. You can simplify if you need to do it. But knowing how to train, somebody can give you the perfect training program. You don't know how to do it. You don't know how to do it. You don't do it correctly. You kind of have to creak with it, right? So I think falling in love with training is is important. Um, if I that that would be my pie in the sky, like, but I also know that's not always realistic. Um, but I would say, hey, you know, at least have a good basis and understanding on how to train and what intensity looks like and how to train hard. Um, my other one would be that I know we mentioned this, but make sure you have the time and the money to do it. Um, I think that's something that people really don't understand is like Lexi said, it's the point that, that most of us are at or we're all at is, you know, there's not a big difference between prep and not prep. People say, well, when are you starting your prep? So you're basically always on prep to some extent. I mean, we really are like, you're either just on a building or a cutting phase. It's really, there's really no difference in, in the lifestyle itself. Yeah. You have some freedom and you can eat out, you can do more things. Um, but the mentality never really changes, not for me at least with it. Um, so I think it's the, the time, but for, for people who haven't done this before, I don't think they understand how, you know, mentally time consuming it can be. Um, especially for a first show, it can be overwhelming. It can be drinking from a fire hose because there's so many things coming at you and there's so much information out there and there's so many people telling you this is the way you need to do something. Even if you have a coach and you listen to your coach, you still got got people barking in your ears all the time with, with different, maybe you should try this. Maybe you should do this. How about you try this? Well, have you asked this? Um, so I think that part is important. And, um, and lastly, I think it's someone's, I think we all, I want to touch on this, like someone's mental state mm -hmm. on there. Um, life doesn't have to be great. Everything in your life doesn't have to be in order. I'm not saying it has to be like that because there is no perfect time to start to prep, but 
you have to be mentally strong and you have to have thick skin. Um, you have to have those things because let's be honest, guys, like you are standing on stage basically naked, having somebody look at you and judge you based purely on your looks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you now, that's what people that. look at it as. Ooh, that's but that's like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the honest, like, that's how most people see bodybuilding, you know, as a vanity show with it. But I don't look at it like that. I almost look at it like people are judging my work, not me. It's like personally. art. Yeah, it's, it's for your like artwork. Art. Yeah. But your you sculpture. have to also know that, like, even if you worked really hard, you still might do not do well. And that's mm-hmm. a, like, so it's important to have a balance between that mindset is like, I'm, I feel like I'm thinking of it as if they're judging my work, but knowing realistically that they're not judging your work. They're judging no. the results of your work yep. compared to everyone else's results of their work. Uh, your effort doesn't matter. Yeah. Your effort doesn't matter, but it does because you obviously need effort to have, mm-hmm. you know, outstanding results. Yeah. I think yes. those are really important, especially the first one that you said, that's one that I... I talk to a lot of people when they first reach out about competing and I ask them, you know, what their timeline is and what their goal is just to kind of see where they're at before I, you know, put my preferred timeline on it Mm -hmm. on them is like, is this a bucket list item or do you want to, you know, do you see yourself wanting to go far with this? And some people really do just want it to be a bucket list item. They just want to try it out. And I used to have that same mindset as you is like, I, you know, I wish people would take this more seriously, but the reason our, our sport is not so niche anymore is because of bucket listers. Yep. Those are the people that put money into the sport. The most money into the sport happens from soccer moms and like mm-hmm. people that are just bucket listers and pe- like those are the people that are coming back to NPC shows every single year and like trophy hunters as some people call them like they yeah it kind of sucks if you think about it one way but it's also really great because it's part of why our sport is as big as it is now mm-hmm. is because there's so many of those people and yeah and that's some of them how I struck off. out yeah well yeah exactly. and, I, and I wanted to clarify that a little bit on it when I say a bucket list item I I mean that um they don't really put the effort in, in yeah. prep. They just want to go out there on stage. That and I'm not like necessarily that, yes. But now, if you if you want to give it your all and you want to work hard with it, then like, just that's the part I I find to be important. And not just for that. I think everyone gets a lot out of it. Yeah. Like you learn a lot about yourself. Of course. Pushing that way. Now, obviously, if somebody just wants to get, I'll help them do that. Obviously, but um. Yeah. And when, when I said before, too, about, like, your effort doesn't matter, I mean, to the judges, your effort doesn't matter. Just, like, how much you lift doesn't matter. Just, like, how hard you diet doesn't matter. Just, like, how much you lift in the gym doesn't matter. Just, like, your scale weight doesn't matter. None of that matters. They don't yeah. care. They don't ask you any of those questions. It's just purely what you look like. Mm-hmm. Right. And sometimes, I, I can attest to this, I've got beat by people that I know don't work near as hard as me. Not even in the same ballpark. And you have to be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to mentally prepare. Yeah. I... It's, yeah, I feel like you just, you have to have thick skin going into the sport, you know? I've known people that let the placing dictate their entire self-worth and, you know, they just spend the next few months after that show day feeling awful about themselves, you know, and just, I feel like if if you're that type of person, you're not, this is not the sport for you. I mean, you just have to have that thick skin. And if you can only think, like, three months at a time, You know, I think long-term goal planning is really important in bodybuilding and not just thinking like, oh, all I need is 12 weeks to prep. Like, yeah, you might only need 12 weeks to prep, but if you're not in a good place to be 12 weeks out, then you need more time, whether it's more time in an off season or more time in a prep, um, or maybe you stay leaner year round, you can take less time to prep, but it's important to think longer term. Even if you start that prep, you're 12 weeks out, and you you get to the show, it doesn't end after that. Like Evan said, it's like, this is a year round thing if you're anything more than a bucket lister. Even if you are a bucket lister, like you still have to take care of yourself after that show. You're not gonna be very happy if after the show you just say fuck it and like go back to eating like an asshole. You you have to be able to take care of yourself and take care of your health and be intentional about how you exit a show, whether you're going to do it again or you're never going to touch a stage again. Okay. On right, Dan, what's your other two? Huh? What's your other two? Okay, no, I just thought, well, one of them, it's off of what Rachel just said, is, you know, today's topic is how to know when you're ready to start prep. Well, how much weight do you have to lose? 
for mm-hmm. bikini girls, I tell them like no more than 20 pounds. If you That's have hard. 30, 40, 50 pounds to lose, you can't do that in one prep. Uh, absolutely agree. Like even if you have 20 pounds to lose, it's plan on it taking six months. If you're going to do it right and to maintain muscle uh, and naturally, obviously. So, I mean, I think that that is a huge factor. Unfortunately, I ran into too many scenarios where someone wants to start a prep and maybe they are in a good spot metabolically. Um, you know, they've got the calories to work with. They aren't, aren't doing a ton of cardio, but they have 30, 40 plus pounds to lose. And it's like, okay, yeah, we can start dieting right now, but probably not going to be able to do a show this year. Cause the thing is, is we're going to have to diet and get off as much as we can right now and treat it like a prep. But then we're going to have to reverse out of that to get your calories back up and your cardio back down. And we're going to have to do that for a while so that you're ready to diet the next time. So like, that is a huge factor. People who are in that scenario, it's going to be at least a year before they get on stage if they want to do it. If they want to get stage lean. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, like you said, Evan, I think that was a great point earlier about how it depends. Like, what is your purpose and reason for doing the show? What do you want out of it? What You know, what do you want to happen on that stage? If they're literally just doing it because I just want to lose as much weight as possible and maybe they don't care if they don't get stage lean. Maybe they're just using it as their one thing to stick to a diet. Cause that was kind of me too. Like Evan, you said That's that was your so I you needed something to make you stick to it. I was very, very similar in that. And my whole purpose was I wanted to have a flat stomach cause I never had that in my life prior to that. At least not one that I was happy with. And so my, I didn't care if I won or not. I just wanted something that was going to force me to stick to my diet. And that was the competition prep. And, you know, I ended up falling in love with the process and the journey and the show day. And that's why I am where I am today. I coach for it and been competing off and on for 10 years. So, um, yeah, I think where someone is at body fat wise is a huge thing. And my other big one I wanted to uh, touch on, which Evan actually kind of mentioned, but I want to go into more detail, is the amount of time that it requires in your schedule. So you need time to cook your food, to prep your food, to eat your food. Sometimes eating your food is a damn job. <laughs> um, sure, it's an option. You have to have time for cardio. You have to have time for posing. I mean, it is hours and hours out of your day. And that's another reason I know I'm not ready to start one anytime soon. I don't have a, a couple extra hours laying around these days as a first-time mom. Like, I'm still trying to figure that whole side of my life out. So. Um, while I may be in a good spot metabolically, actually I'm in a great spot metabolically, I know that I don't have the time in my schedule right now to commit to it. And so sometimes I've ran into that with clients before too, where it's like they technically could, in regards to all these other factors that we've talked about, they don't have that much weight to lose, but at the same time, it's still going to require a lot of time, a lot of dedication and time. And it's like, if they're literally going, you know, waking up at 5 a.m. and, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. And if they're going straight from doing an hour of cardio in the mornings to getting the kids ready to school, taking them to school, going straight to work, then going straight to work to pick up the kids, then they go get their lift in in the evenings, and then they got to go home and cook the family dinner, and then they got to do house chores, and it's like, okay, we need to do more cardio now, but there's no time left in the day, and we still have to prioritize sleep. Mm-hmm. I think that's so, a really good point you bring up, especially with the, the cardio. I didn't even really think about this, but and what you were saying about like the no more than 20 pounds overweight especially as a as a female too and as a male like understand that your starting point will greatly dictate how tough prep is going to be and how time consuming it's going to be because if you have to do two hours of cardio a day and you have to get ten thousand steps in a day and you have to train and you have to have your life and you have to cook you are not going to be sleeping barely anything i mean and if you don't sleep you can't be honest yeah yeah so (laughs) I, I do think that that is a really, really big part of See, it. this is um, why you can't limit me to three. What the hell? <laughs> but I'm glad you went over those last two. Those are good. Um, yeah, They're I like important. both of those. Like, I, I always say prep is essentially it's like a part-time job, you know? The, the time is it's huge. It's huge. You have to have that time to allocate towards your prep for sure. But that bring that reminds me of something that I think it's important to think about when if especially as a first time or newer competitor but really anyone prep is sure it's a part-time job because of how much time we have to devote to all of those things you guys mentioned but it don't pay the bills so like sure. you have to be able to manage your time effectively and not let your entire life fall apart if you are treating everyone around you like shit if you're acting like you're you know, the better than anyone because you're a bodybuilder and you decided to prep or if you're 
um, you know, extra moody and you let take that out on people, or you, maybe you're not responding well and you take that out on people, like that, that sucks. You need to think about why you're doing this if you're letting it affect your life so much. Because it's not, it, it might, it's probably not worth ruining relationships. And I see a lot of, I see that happen a lot, especially with less experienced people, but pros as well, is they let it ruin their marriage. I've seen marriages break up because of bodybuilding, um, because they just took bodybuilding probably more seriously than they were ready to take it at that time in their life. Yeah. And I think, I think the reasons for that change is I think when you're just starting, I was, I used, I was used to not be the best with it. And I still have days towards the end where I'm not great. Sure. I think we all do. Um, but at the beginning it was inexperience. And then the later I did it and more shows I did, it was not inexperience. It was the pressure I was putting on myself instead. Um, which I had a big long talk with Nick about that the other day and putting pressure on ourselves and everything else with it. And it's, um, Eventually, you just kind of got to realize that, you know, it, it's good to be competitive and it's good to put pressure on yourself, but there is a limit there of healthy balance. Um, For sure. And learning that is not always the easiest, especially in someone like me who's a high type A, very extremely competitive personality. Um, that's not always the easiest place to find. Um, but, you know realizing that you need to find it is is very important and that is the first step to actually getting there and finding it which i, I think i have found it just took me a little bit to get there yeah same so i have a um a little client scenario i wanted to share that just happened this past week so I had a girl she started working with me she's probably going to figure out who that i'm talking about her but um she started working with me about maybe like eight weeks ago or so and she has phenomenal shape really good potential for bikini i was very excited to start working with her and uh, she was pretty adamant about starting prep right away and doing a show this November. And I think it was only going to be 12 weeks total. She doesn't have that far to go, but she's never prepped before. Um, and I was very, very hesitant, as you guys can understand why. But she was in a decent start. And I'm like, okay, you know, here are my concerns. I'm not 100% sure on this. You know, it really depends on what are your goals with the sport? Where do you see yourself? And so, you know, we kind of talked through all that. And she really just wanted to see how, it, you know, what prep was like and if she could do it and just challenge herself. I'm like... Okay, I wasn't going to lose this client because I told her no when I thought that there was a small chance we could make it happen. So I'm like, I, I, I want to see how it goes too. So we started dieting and she did, she was making progress, but I kind of did a little reverse psychology on her and she had to figure it out herself that we weren't going to get her to where we both wanted her to be in that time. I think she would be good, but I knew we weren't going to get stage lane. And so I kind of had to let her diet for about six weeks and we started to have to get, we were starting to have to get pretty aggressive given the timeline and she was responding, but not as well as we wanted. And she, um, basically came to me last week. We had a call. She wanted to catch up and decided, I think you're right. Um, I don't think I should do this show. I know that I can be better than that. And so we decided to um, basically completely change our plan. We're going to do a show next year. We're going to reverse for a little bit. And I think she's going to come in so much better and really kill it like her first time on stage. So it really depends a lot, like Evan said earlier, about um, what their goal is, what they what they want to happen on stage, whether it's their first show or not. And, you know, sometimes as a coach, we have to – I don't even know. Like I said, I used a little bit of reverse psychology. I needed her to figure mm -hmm. it out herself. I needed her to know what pushing was like and to see how her body was going to respond. So I think we've got a great plan going forward. Yeah, that's a really, really smart idea. I don't know, like, especially like when it comes to people like with bucket list item, um, if someone's a little bit heavier and almost want to do like a transformation into it, um, I, I am brutally honest with them in a very respectful way. And I say, hey, you know, can we get you on stage? The best you've ever looked? Absolutely. Absolutely. But do be aware of the time frame that you want to do this in. You are probably not going to look like you think you're going to look. Mm -hmm. And just them knowing that and just putting that information out there helps set that expectation, I believe. And then once they have that information, they can decide what they want to do. I have some people that say, sure, yeah, no, that's fine with me. Absolutely. I just want to do it. But then there's other people that's like, Really, you don't think I can, I can, I can look like this? And they'll send like a picture of a pro. I'm like, no, I, I I'm sorry, that's, that's not the way it's gonna be. Um, you know, maybe three, four years down the road if you're consistent with it. But setting that expectation and then letting them know, hey, you know, if this was easy, 
then everybody in the world would look like this. I mean, there's only value in things that are difficult to get. Like if a six, there's a reason that, you know, you see guys with six packs on the front of magazines because it's hard to get. That's what, that's what gives things value is difficulty and being rare yeah. and having to work for them. Um, and I think really setting that expectation and just, just knowing. And so everyone's on the same, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways is you, whoever, you know, the athlete and the coach need to be on the same page with what the goal is. And both of them need to believe in that goal. And both of them need to believe in each other that you can get them there. Um, because if you don't have that, it's going to be a rough trip. Amen to that. Amen. Well, I feel like we've covered a lot. And we're in a good place to, to wrap this up. But A.K.A. Yeah. Rachel's got to pee. No. And, well, okay. <laughs> I think we know by now. I would just mute myself and leave if I needed to do that. Sure. No. no. Okay. <laughs> It's AKA no, we're at an Lex- hour and ten. That's why I said that. Yeah, I was going to say, no, it's AKA Lexi's got to run to the gym to get a workout in before this hurricane hits. Yeah, so. Lexi's got <laughs> to do some hurricane chasing or Hur- running. Yeah, hurricane chasing. Evan's I'll, just I'll, gonna hold it, hold it down. I'm so, I'll, I'll, I'll hold it down for you, Lexi. I'll, I'll, <laughs> Thank I'll, I'll, you, I'll, Evan. I'll let you know how awesome it's gonna be with no traffic, and and I don't just have that far it's gonna going. be awesome. Um, yeah. It's going to be great. <laughs> well, hopefully we, we will see you guys all again the next recording. And Lexi and so. Evan don't get <laughs> blown away um, by next week. But, yeah, thanks for listening. Hur- hurricanes fear me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no comment. Thanks for no, listening, guys. No comment. Leave reviews, share this with your friends, tag us on Instagram. We love, uh, we love seeing you guys tag us. Let us know if you have any topics you want us to cover. I think pretty soon we're going to do uh, like an all Q&A episode um, towards the, the end of middle, end of October. So keep an eye out for our Instagrams. We'll post some question boxes for that. All right. Perfect. Bye, guys. Bye. See y'all.